In social ontology, we try to build theories to explain the metaphysical workings of the social world. We want to explain how social facts and social kinds and social entities come about. We want to know how these social facts and such relate to each other and to other non-social facts. In this short video, I want to draw attention to an issue that social ontologists haven't done much work on. But as it concerns a very basic feature of social reality, it's something that social ontologists should think about. The feature in question is what I'll call cultural variation. To get going, let me make two simple observations. Basic observation number one, social facts are facts. Social scientists take themselves to be describing features of the world. Basic observation number two, there is cultural variation in how we do things. For example, in Europe, clothing has to be black to be appropriate for a funeral. In China, clothing has to be white to be appropriate for a funeral. That's simplifying things a little, but that's roughly the rule. Now, uh, let's put this together. In some sense, it's a fact that only black clothing is appropriate funeral wear, and also it's a fact that only white clothing is appropriate funeral wear. But is it a fact that appropriate funeral wear is only black and only white? Well, no, obviously not. If it were, it would be metaphysically impossible to dress for a funeral. So what's going on here? Well, the obvious thing to say is that we've missed out on some qualifiers. Some important job is being done here by qualifications like in Europe and in China. Because we're making those qualifications, the social facts we're registering don't really come out as being incompatible with each other. But the challenge that cultural variation presents for social ontology is explaining what precisely these qualifications or similar ones like for the Europeans or in European culture do in metaphysical terms. We understand well enough in free theoretical terms how such qualifications work and we have no problem using them effectively. But how do the theories that we've built to explain social reality apply here? We have a theoretical understanding to some extent of um, the mechanisms that give rise to social facts. But how do those mechanisms work to give rise to different facts in different places or for different people? Now, this puzzle of intercultural variation bears a similarity to other puzzles in metaphysics. Now Socrates is sitting, now Socrates is standing up. How can he be both sitting and standing up? Well, he is sitting at time t1 and standing at time t2. As far as it goes, this answer is both intuitive and satisfying. Nevertheless, if you're a philosopher of time, the work only starts there. For what is it for something to be the case at a time? Much ink has been spilled over that. Our issue is a bit like this, apart from any ink being spilled over it. Now, even though social ontologists haven't said much about how we should understand cultural variation, that doesn't mean that their theories don't have resources that bear on the matter. Let us take, for example, Searle's theory of social facts, as it's probably still the most well known. Any theory of social metaphysics has to do one thing, which is account for the fact that social reality is in some broad sense, a matter of convention. So for his part explains this by saying that populations collectively accept what he calls constitutive rules governing social facts. Different rules are possible, but the ones we actually accept are the ones that explain how social reality in fact works. Now this idea of different possible constitutive rules gives us something to say about intercultural variation. How can it be that white is appropriate funeral wear for Chinese people, but not for Europeans? Well, the social facts in question are governed by different constitutive rules because the two communities have simultaneously collectively accepted different ones. It's a pretty, pretty natural diagnosis and other theories in social ontology, as long as they have some resource for explaining the conventionality of social reality can generally say something to a similar effect. And it's a start for sure. It gives us a characterization of the situation we're in when there's cultural variation on some point but it doesn't take us very far yet. In a way, it just moves the questions. Why is it exactly that the simultaneous operation of two different rules doesn't create some kind of logical contradiction? This we still don't know. We might wanna say something like this. Some cases are governed by one rule, some are governed by another, and no cases are governed by both rules. All right, but what is it for some case to be governed by one constitutive rule rather than another? Do constitutive rules have some kind of spheres of operation associated with them? How do those work? what pins down in a given case what the operative rule is. Now, I want to stress that Searle's theory isn't any kind of special case here. Other theories in social ontology generally take us about this far when it comes to modeling cultural variation, and beyond that, we're just left to speculate. So it remains everyone's problem. I don't want to suggest that it is in some sense an issue that resists theorizing like a paradox of some sort. 
I am quite hopeful that we can build some tools and extend our theories to account smoothly for cultural variation. But it is something that we haven't done, and it's something that we need to do. Thanks very much.